to see each of you here this morning, brothers and sisters. I am thankful, as always, that you have chosen to come out and be with us. We know there are those who are not here. For various reasons, I'm sure, some are shut in at this moment, and we keep them in our thoughts and our prayers, and hopefully they will be better and be back on their feet and going soon. And others perhaps just aren't here. Who We, we don't always know, but we keep, keep each other in our prayers. And speaking of prayers, I would ask you to bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, we humble ourselves before you in prayer and praise and exalt you. Father, we humble ourselves as we come here to worship you. We pray that we will do so in accordance with your will, that we will do all things as your word teaches us. Father, we pray that we will be faithful to study your word, diligent in our studies, that we'll look at these things and apply them to our lives, that we will live as you would have us to live, Father, that we will teach your word to others, that we will do all that we can to bring lost souls to you, Father. We pray these things humbly in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Bible speaks of, and we have studied on more time, on more occasions than I can count or, or would even try to, I'm sure. Since we record the lessons, we could go back and look. But it, re it speaks on, and again we have spoken on and taught on, not just myself but others, about the church. The Bible very beautifully describes the church. If you look there in Ephesians chapter 5 and, and verses 22 and following, we read, of course, Jesus, it, or Paul writing there, God by inspiration is teaching there the about, of course, the point that Paul makes is about the husband and the wife and the relationship, but in that he uses this illustration, or I'm saying it backwards here, I know, but, but he teaches about the church and, and, and Christ and their relationship, and in there he uses the illustration of the husband and wife. I, I'll get it out uh, at some point here. But, but we see there that he, he, he lays out in that illustration about the husband and wife, and in doing so he very beautifully describes the relationship that Christ has with his his church and that the church is to have with him if you notice there in chapter 5 of of ephesians if you notice beginning in verse 25 husbands love your wives even as christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. A very beautiful description. I, I, I personally believe that, that it is very beautiful and, and descriptive there and, and shows the love that Christ has for his church. And, and we understand this is not the only text that teaches us about this. We see in, in his discussion of the elders, and, and specifically to the elders of, of the church at Ephesus, there in, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, Paul here is speaking and says, to these elders, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, the flock being, of course, the church, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So in these texts and, and in others, we see the viewpoint that Christ and that God has of his church. 
And therefore, the view that you and I ought to have for his church. We have on the bulletin, and of course, I think those who, who really put it up there, the bulletin board, that is, uh, our family. We have the pictures of, of the various ones here. And so we think of ourselves, and we are a family, and we are... We are the bride of Christ, and we ought to understand that and love the church as Christ loves his church. This morning, I want us to look at some things, both internally and externally, that can, in fact, kill the church. We talk about the congregation here, the church here in Sedalia, and we look at the church, and it's been here longer than I've been alive. And I know that some of you have been here, and were here, and, and not to call anybody old here, but some of you have been here since before I was born. And, and so you know a lot about this congregation, and you have been here when the congregation here has been up, and when it's been down. And when it has been going, things have been going well, and I'm sure when things have come up that have been problematic. And just as any congregation, this congregation faces at times different problems, different uh, things that in fact, and, and I assure you that there are more things that we could discuss than what we will discuss this morning, but, but the, you have seen many things that could have simply destroyed this congregation, and yet it is still here. We look at ourselves, and it's easy to think, well, we, we are so small and, and so easily, we may not be here. But brothers and sisters, looking, and we're going to look at some things negatively, I suppose, here, but if you look at it from the positive perspective, if we overcome these things, if we handle these things, then we find that in fact the church will remain and will be here long after we are all gone, all departed from this life, that is. I want to look at some things that can come from the outside, if you will, externally, that could be detrimental to the church, can in fact kill the church, kill the congregation here. We see, of course, persecution could do just that. Now, we live in a society, and I am thankful, thankful that this is the case. We live in a society where we are relatively free from persecution, if you will, as far as we aren't expecting and we don't see the government knocking the door down, dragging us out because... We're here. Now that could change. I don't mean to be political in my statements here, but there are those who are opposed to Christianity, who are opposed to the church, and I assure you there are those, and I'm not trying to single out a particular candidate or a particular person for a particular office, but we have seen those who do all they can to persecute the church. Uh, the mayor, I believe it was in Houston a few years ago, decided to tell the local churches, the local preachers, that they must first submit their lessons, their sermons, to her before they could preach the sermons. Of course, that's a bit unconstitutional, but it's also not biblical. We look and we see that indeed persecution can do that. Olivia and I were talking in our Bible class this morning. We were looking at uh, Satan and, and we went through some things and, and some of the things that we were looking at beyond the mere lesson there that, that was in the lesson itself. Some of the things there, I, I told her, we, we basically kind of put together a sermon and it's one I want to work on and look at in, in the very near future about Satan himself. But Satan is one who is out to destroy the church. We need to understand that, brothers and sisters, and, and, and that, is, that is true uh, of, of reality, 
That is, that is really what, what is going on. And there are those who are following, if you will, Satan. And, and, uh, and they are out to destroy the church as well. We look in, in Revelation chapter 2 and in verses 8 and following, we find one of those two congregations, the seven churches of Asia Minor, as you're turning there. And, and we find the, one of those two, Smyrna specifically, one of the two congregations who, in fact, Christ had no negative things to say about. He, he, he did not have any criticisms of them. And speaking, we see in verse 8, he's speaking to the church in Smyrna. He says in verses 9 and 10, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Here Jesus describes these individuals who in fact are persecuting them and, and, and all as the synagogue of Satan. Those who are following him, who are following his works, who are following his deeds, if you will. And, and we see that in our society, in our world today. Yes, at this present time, you and I are pretty free to come here and to worship as the Lord teaches us to do so. But we must remember that could easily change at any given time. That there are those who are out to destroy the church. One politician, the former governor of Ohio, recently endorsed, and he, by the way, is, is a professed Republican, and I, I, again, I'm not saying this to get into politics, but... But to simply use as an example here, we see here that this individual who, who, who is a self-described Republican endorsed the Democrat for, presidential, for the presidential race and said of those of us who are opposed to abortion, who are social conservatives, that we need to simply set aside our views to bring people together. Does that sound familiar, brothers and sisters? You find those even in religion who say that, that we need to, as the word is used, be ecumenical. That we need to get along with the various denominations and just come together and agree to disagree, we might say. Brothers and sisters, we see here that... that Smyrna is told that they will suffer these persecutions. And, and we need to be aware that this is true not only of, of Smyrna, but in fact that many would do so then and have done so since and, <laughs> and suffer persecution today. 1 Peter chapter 5 in verses 8 and 9, we read, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are, acceptable, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So here again, Peter here referring to Satan, talks about this roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. Peter knew something about this, by the way. For If you remember when, when Jesus was talking to Peter there before the crucifixion, what did he in fact tell him? He told him that in fact Satan desired to have him that he might sift him the Bible says, Jesus said, that he might sift him, he might howl him, and, and, and be able to take advantage of him. And, and as I was reading some material again on, on Olivia's class and, and, and the shaking, sifting as they would do, and, 
And it kind of reminds me of, you ever watch the movies about where they were panning for gold and they put them in these big things and they would shake them up and of course, if you ever made you flour and used one of the sifters, you, you've seen that too. There's another form of a sifter. And, and there's the idea. And, and so we see here that certainly that there are those who, who are out to do so. Out to destroy the church. 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery tribulation, the fiery trial, excuse me, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You know, we shouldn't be surprised when these things come about. You ever watch those who are against God, who, who, who in some occasions may be self-professed atheists, who may believe in God, but they don't like the church. And what do they do? They attack the church, don't they? They criticize the church. They say the church, oh, well, we're just divisive. Oh, the church, you're the folks, you, you hear this often, you're the folks that think you're the only ones right, the only ones going to heaven. They, they, they do all they can to destroy the church. We think of Paul, and we read there in Acts chapter 8, and in verses 1 through 3, Paul, he was then known, of course, as Saul. But you recall that he was an enemy of the church, was he not? He was persecuting the church. As a matter of fact, there in verses 1 through 3, as we read, we find what? We find that Paul, Saul, was, was out to destroy the church. And he went about hauling men and women off to prison, throwing them in jail. He was consenting. We look in the previous chapter, chapter 7. He was consenting to the death of Stephen, the martyr of, of the Lord, a martyr of the Lord. So we see that here he is doing what he can to destroy the church. And brothers and sisters, Saul wasn't alone. After all, if you look at the conversion of Saul, you read there in chapter 9, and of course you can read in chapters 22 and 26 of the book of Acts. You read about the conversion. But, but you look and you see, and when he, was, when he was going along with the Jewish people at that time, when the Jewish leaders, they loved him, didn't they? They were sending him out, gave him letters to, to go to Damascus to persecute the church. Seek out those who were following after the church, after Christ. But as soon as he switched over, was converted to the truth, what did they do? They set out to kill him, didn't they? Over and over. They had, he had to be let down in a basket from a window so that he could escape. And over and over they, they tried to persecute him and tried to destroy him. And of course, they were trying to destroy to the church. But brothers and sisters, you and I, we may face persecution. But that question comes to mind... What will we do if that is the case? If we are persecuted from without, from those who are out to destroy the church, how will we respond? When someone attacks the church, how do we respond? I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have heard others criticize the church. How have we responded? Have we responded by keeping quiet? Have we responded by saying nothing? Perhaps we've responded by agreeing. Perhaps we've done the very thing. So where you see, the persecution can come from within as well. We've been talking, of course, about persecution from without the body of Christ, from without the church. But the truth is, we can find those in the church who persecute the church. You will find those who are professed Christians, who have obeyed the gospel, who have been in the church, who, have, who will tell you that we need to change the church and they will persecute the church. We don't respond 
by keeping our mouth shut. We don't respond by doing nothing. We don't respond by allowing these things. We speak up, brothers and sisters. We defend the church. We face those persecutions. We remain as we read there in Revelation chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, specifically verse 10. We remain faithful unto death. I've said before, and, and of course, the issue there in the church or in the community there in Houston, Texas, where the mayor was, was speaking out was over the subject of homosexuality. I've said before, brothers and sisters, of course, I've pro preached on the subject, uh, even without being told you couldn't, but I can assure you that if I was told on this subject or any other subject that I could not preach the truth, the very next sermon that would be preached would be on that subject that I was told I couldn't be preaching on because I would preach on that truth. But how would we? Would we cave so that we weren't hauled off to jail? Brothers and sisters, there are many things uh, that, that are out there that, that come to mind that can kill the church. Worldliness is another one. We see in looking at, at the, the worldliness that is about us, we think of immorality. We think of uh, intellectualism, materialism. These things, brothers and sisters, can kill the church. I've been reading, I, I told you this, I guess last week, maybe the week before, probably last week, but I mentioned, of course, been reading some things on evolution and, and studying some various books and, and reading <coughs> multiple books on, on that subject and, and looking at it. And yes, at some point, I'm sure we'll have a, a sermon on that. But, but brothers and sisters, we look at these things and, and these things, we hear people who say, Oh, you folks down there at the church, you are just ignorant. You're stupid. You don't understand. I, I mentioned to, to someone I know, he and I have been talking about this, self-described atheist, uh, an evolutionist. Uh, he, he and I were talking, and I told him that in our conversations, it has motivated me to read some of these things. I've had the material. I've read some of it before. But to, to, to read these things, and it was interesting the question I was asked. Was I smart enough to understand what I was reading? There was, there was the thought. And there's the view that many people intellectually have of those who profess to be Christians. We're too stupid to understand. It's kind of interesting to me, by the way, and perhaps to you, that the Bible teaches that God considers those who hold such views as foolish. God is wise. His wisdom is far beyond theirs. He looks at them and he sees them as being foolish. As being ignorant, brothers and sisters. But again, it's not just that, but we see that there is materialism and, and the idea that, that we've got to have and got to gain. And, and brothers and sisters, I was talking, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I, I, I'm going to. I, I often say things I probably shouldn't, but I'm going to do so again today. But I was talking to someone, one of the members of the church, I won't identify who it was, but I was talking about, and, and to someone else as well, about the, the fact that I could go out and I could find a job that paid me far more than I make in my secular job. I go out and work and make a lot more money and, and all of that. But in order to do that, brothers and sisters, I'd have to do two things. I'd have to give up more time with my child, which I refuse to do. And I would have to, in fact, give up more time than what that I have to work with the church. It is prioritizing, brothers and sisters. There are many people who set about their lives, and there's a song that comes to mind at this time where it talks about Oh, 
oh, I can't think of the song. It's an older song and, 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 and all. And, and it, the guy singing about when he was, when, when he was young, when the, the son, that is, was young, he wanted the father to go out and do things with him, and the father wouldn't. And then when he grew up, he goes off to college, he comes back, and the father says, hey, let's go out and do things. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, here. And he says, well, Dad, I want, actually, I wanted to borrow the car from you. Some of you may know the song I'm talking about, but, but you know, the cat's in the crater. You would come to mind. Cat's in the crater. Brothers and sisters, prioritizing. We think about these things. We think about immorality. And, and the, the Bible, of course, warns us uh, against these things. The evil, uh, physical pleasure, we might say. We think of materialism and covetousness. Of course, the Bible tells us not to be covetous. Uh, and so we look at all these things. And these things, brothers and sisters can destroy, can kill the church. Again, how do we respond to these things? These things that can so easily affect us. We think about the temptation of Jesus there in, in Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. How was he, he uh, tempted? He was tempted with the pride of life, right? He was tempted with with and, and, and I knew just as soon as I started trying to list it off, I would get it all mis mixed up in my mind. But the the pride of life, the, the anyway, you know which one I'm talking about. And, and of course, we see the same thing. Uh, why don't I just turn to the text that teaches that, brothers and sisters, in in first chapter and. Um, First John chapter 2 and verse 16. The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These three, these are the things we see that Christ is being tempted with, right? And that in fact, you and I, in all ways, in all points, Christ is tempted, was tempted, as you and I were tempted and are tempted. That is the way. Those, that list is the way in which Christ was tempted because every sin falls into one of those three. These things can kill a church if we let those things pull us away. Let's look. And, and though we could say those things come from within, in, in many ways they do come from without, but let's look at some things from within, brothers and sisters, that can in fact destroy or kill the church. We see... That ignorance can, in fact, kill the church. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 6, Hosea says here, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. God, of course, talking through Hosea here. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Brothers and sisters, knowledge, lack of knowledge, that is, can destroy the church. Ignorance can destroy the church. When we think about this, we think about it, and one of the things in, in the Bible class this morning that I pointed out is there in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, as we read, that we, how do we resist the devil? We, we do so by putting on the whole armor of God. Putting on the whole armor of God and, and, and arming ourselves. And you go through, and I've said this on previous occasions, you go through and you look at the whole armor of God. And what is it? It's the Word of God. It's truth. It's righteousness. It's... it's, it's it's the sword of truth. It is the word of God. In each case, we see there pointing to God's word. How do you and I handle ignorance? We handle it by picking up our Bibles and studying. By reading. And, and, 
And brothers and sisters, I'll not belabor the point. I know you know uh, the, the various texts that teach us about God's Word and, and, and that teaches us about studying, about meditating upon His Word. We see, we see these things can destroy the church. Ignorance. I, I have an old joke, and I didn't make it up, but, but um, guys asked, are you ignorant or apathetic? And of course the punchline is, I don't know and I don't care. The very definitions of ignorance and ap apathy, of course. We, we see there, brothers and sisters, that apathy can kill a church. Simply not caring. I look and I see you here and, and again I, I feel like I'm speaking to the proverbial choir. I understand, brothers and sisters, you're here. And in various ways, in many ways, you are involved. You care. But we see there are those who don't care. Don't care about their own soul's salvation. Don't care about the well-being of their brothers and sisters of the church. And lest we think ourselves better than everybody else, or we give ourselves, uh, you know, hurt ourselves patting ourselves on the back, let us understand that we can fall into that trap where we don't care. Where we are simply indifferent to the truth. In Revelation chapter 2, we see another congregation. The church at Ephesus. The church that, that Paul writes to and so eloquently and so beautifully describes the relationship between the church and the Lord. A church Paul had been with. A church Paul knew and, and was, was involved with. And, and, and brothers and sisters, Jesus here is talking to them. And what does he say in verse 4? Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. We might think of the church at Laodicea, that one congregation that Christ could find nothing good to say about. Again, he, he had two, the church at Smyrna and the church at Philadelphia, that he, he had nothing but good things to say about. And then he had the, the others who, who he said some good, such as Ephesus, some good about, but some you need to fix these things. And of course then that Laodicea, who he couldn't find one thing to say good about. They were the epitome of indifference. They were lukewarm, brothers and sisters. It, just, it didn't make much difference one way or another, did they? You know, we talk about, and oftentimes we say, well, it's the other people, right? It's the ones who aren't here, and of course I know. Let me be clear, there are those who aren't here because they're shut in. We understand that that's the case. But we, we often look at, it's the other folks, right? Let's look at some things that could perhaps suggest we are indifferent. <clears throat> Not faithfully attending services. Does that describe our attendance? How about not participating when we are here? You know, we, we sing, you know, we sing songs uh, to praise God, to teach and admonish one another. Am I singing those songs or am I indifferent? Do I just not care? doesn't mean anything. Maybe I show up too late. You know, sometimes those things happen. We are late sometimes. I know I have. I'm a procrastinator. Do I show up late every time? Am I always coming in late? Always perhaps leaving early? Am 
not trying to teach others to reach lost souls, not trying to edify brothers and sisters, not calling, we, we talk about those shut-ins, not calling those shut-ins, and of course there's numerous ways to communicate. We can text these days, send emails, we can call, we can go visit. Are we doing those things? Maybe we, you know, it's easy to point. I can stand here and point at others. Am I doing those things? Are you, are we making those efforts? No time, no study on our own, brothers and sisters. But I don't sit down. The only time, I, I've said this before, I'm going to use this illustration. The only time we ever are in our Bibles is maybe when we show up for Bible class or worship service. And that's the only time we ever use our Bibles. If that's the case, brothers and sisters, if we look at these things and we see it's, it, it's amazing how many times these drug companies have and, 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 and all they, they, you can always tell when it's a drug company, right? They come on, they start telling you about all these symptoms of this disease that you've never heard about. And you need to go online and you need to look at these symptoms and you need to see if you in fact have it. Then you need to go explain to your, they don't put it quite this way, but you need to go explain to your doctor why you have what this is and you need him to prescribe you their medication. Brothers and sisters, do we have these symptoms? If we do, if, if we, and, and we can look at many others, if these things describe us, maybe we suffer from indifference. Maybe we just aren't caring, brothers and sisters. I want to conclude this morning's lesson. Back in the, and I, I went and got it, and back in the August 16th uh, bulletin from this year, I shared used it before, I like it, an article by Brother Jerry Carmichael, where he, it's entitled, I went back to the church and they were gone. I'll just read a little bit here from it, maybe, see how far we get with it, where it says, Rob grew up in a small congregation of the Church of Christ, just outside a little community in the southern U.S., and no, that's not describing me or talking specifically about me, though I did grow up in a small congregation in the southern U.S. Rob's grandparents and other relatives had been some of the founders of this congregation. His parents took him there every time the doors were open when he was young. Rob grew up, received a good education, married a local girl, and settled into family life in his hometown. He gradually drifted away from the little congregation. In fact, he drifted away from the church from church and spiritual activities altogether. He would attend occasionally for special days when his parents would invite him. His parents passed on and he only had a few distant relatives that were so he that were relatives there, so he rarely went back at all. When Rob's oldest daughter was 16, he received a call that she had been in a car accident. She was in a seri in serious condition. He rushed to the hospital and held an around-the-clock vigil at her bedside. Thankfully, she recovered. During his daughter's hospital stay, Rob began praying to God again, something he had not done in a long time. After her recovery, he and his wife decided to return to the little church where he had grown up. Dressed in their Sunday best, they arrived on Sunday morning a little before the regular service time. Rob thought it strange that there were no cars in the parking lot and no one seemed to be around. He waited outside until the starting time of the service had passed. It wasn't until he went to the front door that he noticed a small handwritten sign. Church is closed due to lack of interest. How could it be that, that the church had meant so much to his ancestors had just closed? After some deep soul-searching, Rob realized that he and others like him were to blame for the closing of the local congregation. All those years when he could have been there, actively participating in the activities of the church, evangelizing and bringing in new converts, were wasted. He just somehow had assumed that the church would always be there. Brothers and sisters, and you can go back and read the last little bit of that there, 
Is that what we're assuming? Are we assuming the church will always be here? Because if we are, and we are suffering from these various things that are, again, some cases internally, if we're allowing the persecution, those things that external that are external to push us away, pull us away, then we may one day show back up and find that there's a sign on the door saying church is closed for lack of interest. I hope and pray, as I indicated earlier, brothers and sisters, that long after you and I are gone, from this life, that this church will still be here, that there will still be, and maybe you'll be located in a different spot, outgrew the, the building here or something, but that there'll still be the Lord's church here in this community. But it's up to you and I to be faithful and true to God's <clears throat> word and do what we can. This morning, if you're here, if you have not obeyed the gospel, then I would encourage you, plead with you, to do so. The Bible teaches very plainly what you must do. You must hear the word, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess Him to be the Son of God, and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of your sins. If you're here needing to do so, we would encourage you to do so. We, we can sit down and study with you. We can, we can help you to obey the gospel. I assure you of that. Maybe you're here and you're a Christian. Maybe you haven't been what you need to be. Maybe the lesson today sparks something in you and you say, you know, I know I need to do differently. I need to do better. Or maybe something unrelated to today's lesson, whatever the case be, is he promises that if we're faithful to confess our faults, he's faithful to forgive us. If we can help you in any way, we encourage you to come while we stand and while we sing. Just as